please stand and sing with me? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, and the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, and the Savior's alone through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Sing Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Sing Christ alone one more time. In Christ alone, cornerstone. Weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening and Welcome to our Good Friday service. My name is Pastor Dave. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm just delighted to share this experience with each of you. Before we get started, you should know if you did not grab some communion elements on your way in, uh, they are in a bucket in the back, and so we want to invite you to grab those at one point during the service. What we'll do here today is we'll look at the story, the story of Jesus leading up to the crucifixion. We'll tell the story in seven different acts. In seven different ways, we'll see the light of God be extinguished on the face of this earth. And as we tell this story through six different voices, we want to invite you to reflect, to have quiet time with Jesus, to reflect on what he did for you personally. And as we begin today, I want to begin with this verse, and then I'll open us in prayer and hand it over to Pastor Bethany. It's out of Psalm 22, verses 30 and 31. It says, prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Lord, 
we are that people who were yet unborn at the time of this writing. We are those people who would be declared that you have done it. Father, as we look back on your sons leading up to his death and each step that he took, remind us of our part in your story. Remind us of what you've done for us. Remind us of your great love for each one of us. Father, help us to hear your word this evening. And may it not return void. In the name of Jesus, amen. Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 to 13. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured out on his head as he was reclining at the table. And when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. It was customary to anoint the head of important guests when they would come into a home. And so this woman, seeing that nobody has stepped in to do this for Jesus, she decided, well, I'm going to anoint him. And clearly she does this above and beyond what would be customary. The, perfor- the perfume she used was expensive. It was probably worth a year of a common laborer's wage. It could have been maybe something in her family as an heirloom. And once the jar was broken, it would have to be used quickly. There's no preserving it. It's possible that this perfume, it was an extreme, expensive luxury that was imported from India, used for anointing the dead. It's called nard. Now, the woman, as she's performing this act. I don't think she sees what she's doing as anointing and preparing Jesus for death. What her actions were doing was expressing her deep belief, her deep devotion that she had to Jesus. Jesus was the Messiah, and he deserved to receive the best, the grandest, the most extraordinary, extravagant thing that she was able to give and to offer him. Now, on the other hand, we see the disciples indignant. They were unhappy with the woman's actions and tried to justify other means that would be a more proper use for the money that this perfume was worth. Their concern for the the poor, it's admirable, but really, it's a question of priorities. Jesus' reply to them establishes the right priorities for the situation. What the woman did was beautiful, noble, admirable, because she recognized the special moment of this occasion where Jesus was there with them. Now, Jesus, he's not downplaying giving to the poor. He's saying there is a continual obligation to do this. But what Jesus is trying to do is establish the right priorities for those that want to live a life devoted to following him. Love and devotion to Jesus himself must come before. It must inform all the other agendas and plans that you have, no matter how good they might be, no matter how godly they might be. We must look for these spontaneous, extravagant, extraordinary ways to devote ourselves to Jesus, even 
if people might see it as wasteful? Are you pouring out? Are you giving the best that you have to Jesus? Or are you just trying to follow all of the right rules, the right regulations? It's easy to become jaded or unbalanced in what one sees as valuable or important when it comes to devoting our lives to Jesus. What might be considered a waste could in fact be a beautiful act of devotion to Jesus. What perfume can you offer to Jesus? What memories do people have of you when they think of you and how you show your devotion to Jesus? Unknowingly, this woman gave a proper anointing and burial to Jesus before his death. And it's because of this act of devotion to Jesus that she will be remembered forever. Now up to this point, every king of Israel had been anointed to lead and to serve as they began. Here, Jesus, the Messiah, the king, the anointed one, is being anointed for his death and for his burial. It's this woman's beautiful act that we see the light of the world starting to be snuffed out a little bit more. We read in Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 through 16. We read about Judas Iscariot and how he betrays Jesus. The scripture says, Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. We see here that Judas Iscariot makes a deal with the chief priests. To make this deal, Judas had to seek out the chief priests. They know that Judas is close to Jesus, which gives them access to Jesus they make a deal with Judas that if he leads them to Jesus, they will give him 30 pieces of silver. The 30 pieces of silver represent the cost of a loss of a slave, which would be what Jesus would be equated to. The next step was carefully orchestrated of when and where the chief priests would meet Jesus to take him away. Judas being the, one of the disciples, he sat under the teachings of Jesus and was taught he was the way, the truth, and the life. He was the Messiah and the hope of the world. He had a relationship with Jesus along with the other disciples. He dwelt with Jesus, and this was his community of believers, a community that believed that Jesus wasn't just a prophet, but the future king of kings. Judas made the first effort to reach out to the chief priest to accomplish this mission he was on. It didn't happen by accident. It was intentional. You see, Judas and his pride would overcome him, and he didn't care what the ramifications were by setting up this appointment with the chief priests and Jesus. What would prompt such an action? Could it have been his disbelief that Jesus was the true Messiah or the financial gain? 
Jesus did nothing to warrant such a betrayal. Judas betrayed Jesus and turned away from what he was taught. He placed aside everything that he had known. He deliberately removed himself. He was overcome by disbelief, pride, and greed of a sinful world. Judas gained temporal things on earth, but not eternal. God orchestrated what took place because he set the plan in motion of his son's death on the cross and is in control of his son's destiny. How do you think Jesus felt knowing that someone very close to him betrayed him? The feeling of betrayal stings and hurts those who are close to us. When one wants to betray you, they do it secretly. They know they're not supposed to, just as the chief priest did. They did it during the Passover festival, which is a crowded time. A time where you can hide in the crowd. The priest wanted to avoid a commotion among the people and have him arrested. What would you do if you knew anyone in your close circle betray you? How would you feel? Learn from what we read. Learn from Judas's mistake. Allow yourself to fully believe, to be humble, faithful, and safeguard the truth in your heart. For our relationship with Christ will conquer any betrayal. He will be our cornerstone where we place our hope. We saw the sins of the world snuff out Jesus' life momentarily. Let us now remember how Jesus was betrayed and see the light of this world snuffed out. After Jesus was anointed for burial in the dark corners after he was betrayed, he would eat a meal with his disciples. In Matthew 26, 17 through 19, and then verses 26 through 30, this is what we read. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them and prepared the Passover. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. This would be the third Passover that Jesus spent with his disciples. They would sit around, and normally this was a time of joy. In fact, probably when the disciples said, Jesus, tell us where we should eat this Passover to help us make these preparations. They were looking forward to a joyful meal. But Jesus had his eyes set on the cross. Jesus would redefine, utterly redefine this meal that the Jews had taken for years and years and years. This is called the feast of flight for the Jews, for they would have to eat it hastily. They would have to make it quickly. They would take yeast and throw it out their windows and doors, and they would slaughter this perfect lamb and take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost because only that blood could stop the angel of death from killing their firstborn. See, back in the day, that was the story. Thousands of years before Jesus ever walked the face of the earth, his people were slaves. 
in Egypt. And nine of the ten plagues that God sent to Pharaoh, nine of those plagues were only to the Egyptians, but the tenth plague, it involved everybody. But God provided a way out of death. Like he always will. He provided a way out of death, and it was a substitutionary atonement. It was kill this lamb and post its blood over the doorpost, and you will be saved. And every year, they had this same meal over and over and over again. And little did the disciples know that they were eating with the actual lamb of God across the table from them. And Jesus would redefine that meal utterly and totally by taking it and breaking the bread. And if you have your elements, I want to invite you into this meal at this table with Jesus today. I want to invite you to the table with Jesus. I want you to imagine, as hard as it may be, that you're at that table with him. Him knowing that just in a matter of hours he'd be arrested, knowing that he would spend a night of torture in the high priest's dungeon, and knowing that he would be mocked and put on trial, that it would be a sham, and that he would go to the cross and die. And he sits across the table, and he redefines the Passover meal, and he takes the bread, and he says, this is my body. It's given for you. And then he took the cup. And he called it a new covenant poured out in his blood. A new promise for you and for me. I doubt the disciples could fathom after they've eaten this bread and they said, okay, it's, it's, it's bread, this isn't your body. It's just bread. And then this cup is just a cup that we drink at Passover, Jesus. It, it, it's just a cup. It's just some wine that we normally drink. But now Jesus utterly redefines it. And he says, it's not just a cup. It's a promise. And that promise will be in my blood. And they couldn't even fathom what he was talking about. The Passover was a happy occasion. An occasion of God's coming and God's saving from death. It was a happy occasion. They couldn't fathom the amount of blood that Jesus would have to spill for them. But they took and they drank. So take and drink. This meal would have been puzzling as you're sitting at the table with Jesus. Is he really who he says he is? Is this really the Lamb of God? Can he really do it? Can he really save us? So you're invited to this table. And as Jesus gives this meal to his disciples, and as he redefines Passover, and as he leaves this dinner, he takes one more step into darkness. One more step away from the light. One more step towards the cross. Please stand with me, church. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing lies. The father turns his face away. 
his wounds which marred the chosen one bring many sons of glory sing behold the man behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held in Until it was accomplished, his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in. seated. Matthew 26, verses 69 to 75. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you also are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter denies Jesus not once nor twice, but three times. And there's an escalation with each denial in a couple of senses. They become more public. First, the servant girl addresses Peter directly. He responds back to her within earshot of a group. Then another servant girl addresses a group of people about Peter. Peter responds back to the group. And then finally, one of the bystanders comes to Peter in front of everyone, even presenting him with evidence this last time that he must have been a follower of Jesus because of his Galilean accent. And in another sense, Peter's denials themselves become increasingly emphatic. First, he plays dumb. He simply says he doesn't know what the girl's talking about. Then he explicitly denies not knowing Jesus, or explicitly denies knowing Jesus. And finally, he curses and swears an oath over his denial. 
I think this building public nature and passion behind Peter's denials underscore the guilt and shame that he's building on himself. It's really easy to hear this story and think very lowly of Peter because we'd all like to imagine that we would never deny Jesus. You should have seen it coming after all, right? Jesus told him that he would do it. Jesus warned him that it would happen. But I think we need to be careful because of the context. Peter's denial comes immediately following and in stark contrast with Jesus refusing to deny himself. In front of Caiaphas, the high priest, Jesus boldly and correctly claims to be the Messiah and the Son of Man and is immediately condemned and said to be deserving of death. So there's a very real and present danger for Peter to identify with Jesus. He's reacting out of self-interest to save his own life. And I think also we need to take note of the nature of Peter's first denial. He doesn't explicitly say he doesn't know Jesus. He kind of avoids the question. He doesn't know what the girl's talking about. And so I wonder, too, maybe we wouldn't explicitly deny Jesus ourselves. But how often are we tempted to just downplay a little bit how well we know Jesus or our identity in Christ when it serves us, when the stakes are even much lower than they are here for Peter? So it's not so easy to walk in Peter's shoes. And we may be tempted to view this cloud over Peter's life with the silver lining because we know that Peter goes on to do great things for Jesus in the early church. But in this particular account, the Gospel of Matthew, we're left hanging, and we're left hanging for a reason. Peter brings this prophecy to life. He understands the magnitude of what he's done, and he goes out from that place weeping bitterly. And this is the last time that Matthew mentions Peter by name. We can't know exactly what's running through Peter's head, exactly what he's thinking. Probably a lot of wrestling with his guilt and shame of what he's done. But we know that was certainly a very dark, dark time in Peter's life and in the story of Jesus. And Matthew leaves us hanging so that we would reflect and acknowledge that darkness. And so tonight we extinguish another candle. Let us once stand together and sing church. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find me thine in all in all, cause Jesus paid it all, all to win my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leopard spots and melt the heart of stone. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sing, oh, praise the one. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my 
dead and raise his life up from the dead. Jesus. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died in my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Sing that again. Jesus died in my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus on trial, Matthew 26, 57 through 68. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to sit at the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At least two came forward and said, the man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you, by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do you need? You have now heard the blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answer, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some even slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, who has struck you. Jesus is then delivered to Pilate in chapter 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. Jesus is taken to Caiaphas' house at night and then to the governor's house in the morning. At night, it was impossible to do a capital offense. It had to be uh, done during the day. Um, Peter, again, he stood in the background against Jesus in contrast to Jesus who stood firmly in uh, declaring himself as the Messiah. It is not a formal trial, nor is it unbiased. It's not our modern law here that we have that you're innocent until proven guilty. The objective was to induce the Roman governor to impose the death penalty. The Jewish crowd requested actually the Roman law of crucifixion. Two witnesses were needed to be in agreement um, for legal condemnation of death. These witnesses were chosen to make the accusations stick. Jesus spoke forthrightly regarding the destruction of the temple, which was the current center of religious activity. Jesus knew his divine purpose offered something much greater. Blasphemy in the Old Testament carried the death penalty. 
applying it personally. Have you ever doubted who Jesus is? Have you been amongst your friends and people say, well, he was a good man, he's a historical figure, he might be even a prophet. But have you considered that he truly is who he says he is? I have to say that I myself doubted him as a teenager and put him to trial. And he is everything he says he is and more. So as we extinguish this fifth candle, we're reminded of the crowd's condemning words and their fulfillment. Let him be crucified. And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And they took the reed from his hand and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his robe, put his own clothes back on him, and led him away to be crucified. We don't know how Matthew knows these details. The Gospels are silent on the matter, and we are left to speculate. But if we had been there, I think we would be faced with a dilemma. On one hand, we have the knowledge that God is king, that Christ has the world in his control. And on the other hand, we have the evidence but before our eyes. He is being beaten. He is being led to his death. And I think would be left to wonder if he had any power or control at all. Wouldn't he have done something by now? If he had the strength, wouldn't the light of the world the God of angel armies, wouldn't he have called forth his hosts to right all that is wrong? I think it's a familiar dilemma because we can look at the world around us. We see trial and tribulation. We can look at our lives and see the mess and the disaster that it is. And I think we often wonder, why haven't you moved, O oh Lord? Why haven't you acted yet? Why haven't you healed me? If you had the power, why not? And they took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. These some 600 men would not be Roman legionnaires, they'd be auxiliaries, drawn from the local area, non-Jews, Phoenicians, Syrians, maybe Gentiles, or all Gentiles, uh, maybe Samaritans, but all people who had no love for the Jews. And so this has come full circle. The Jews of the Sanhedrin mocked Jesus for the claim of being the Messiah. And now Gentiles mock him and punish him for the crime of being the king of the Jews. This faux honor guard stands behind and around an alleged king. And he stood before them, beaten and flogged, a bloody mess of humanity, seemingly weak and helpless and alone. And they stripped him of his clothes and poured a scarlet robe on him, twisting a crown of thorns for his head and put a reed in his right hand. Kneeling, they said mockingly, hail the king of the Jews. Why scarlet? Why red? Roman centurions had red cloaks. It was probably simply what they had at hand. But the point is that they made him a deliberate caricature of a king, a cruel crown of thorns for his head, and the reed in his right hand was a parody of a royal scepter. What should be ornate and glorious, a tangible sign of strength and authority of the king, was weak and thin. 
they spit on him. And they took that reed and they beat him over the head. In his full humanness, Christ was battered and bleeding, dressed in a parody of kingly regalia. Scorned and ridiculed in this weakened and exhausted state, mockery degenerates to physical abuse. What true king would look like this? What true king could be allowed to suffer like this? If he had any power, if he had any control, wouldn't he have used it by now? And yet he was fully God, too. And these soldiers had no idea that they witnessed what might have been Jesus' most impressive demonstration of power, his resolve to do nothing in response to the cruel torture and evil mockery with which they afflicted him. The light of the world, the God of angel armies, chose not to strike back to those who oppressed and afflicted him. Just as the prophet Isaiah had said, Jesus did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. But the soldiers don't know any of this. They only seek to taunt and to hurt and to humiliate. For this was to be the penultimate act of cruelty before the bitter ending. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes back on him. And they led him away to be crucified. As a general rule, Romans stripped their prisoners naked before they executed them. We don't know why Jesus was given his clothes back. It's possible that this was a regular consideration done for Jewish sensibilities, but we don't know. Normally they'd be naked. This would add to the shame, but it also made inflicting pain more easily because they'd be flogged on the way to the cross as if they had not suffered enough. Something else we know all too well is that the suffering, the both the physical pain and the mental anguish combined with the abject humiliation that has been heaped upon Jesus' head that he suffers at the hands of these soldiers is difficult to deal with. It's difficult to contemplate and difficult to dwell upon. And we're still left with the dilemma. The knowledge that Christ is all-powerful and in control of all things. And yet when we see with our own eyes that our king is battered and bruised and bleeding and being led away for execution. Will the light of the world really let the light of his life, the light that he has brought into our lives, will he let it be extinguished? And then there was only one candle left. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon. They forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over over him there. Above his head they placed the written charge against him. This is the king. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one at his right and the other at his left. Those who passed hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross. 
and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let, us re- let, him, let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In this same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma shabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and grabbed a sponge. He filled it with wine and vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. This scripture talks, and I love the way Matthew talks about it, of all these different groups hurling and heaping insults onto Jesus. It's almost like they're offering more sin onto the cross. This week, as I read this scripture and prayed it through, I want to share a fresh insight with you that I had. And it it, it was a challenging insight, something that that I think God brought to mind. And I've preached a thousand times, and now I want to challenge what I've preached a thousand times. And one of them is that what I've said over and over and over again a thousand times is that a holy God cannot be in the presence of sin. And I know those words I've said have come to mind, and I read this scripture, and I thought, oh no, that's completely wrong. A holy God comes and stands in the center of all of our sin and takes it all in. A holy God comes and gets charges leveled against him by all the Pharisees and the chief priests and all the different authorities And the biggest charge against him is that he eats with sinners. That's what holiness looks like. A God who will come in the midst of our sin and allow us to hurl it onto him while he sits there and takes it on the cross. So God can't be in the presence of sin? I don't know. I think Jesus was nailed in between two examples of sin, two rebellious people. He was in the center of the community. He's the center of sin. And and so many times I know that I've said that when I've preached that a holy God can't stand our sin. And, And it's true. God wants to come and purify us and make us holy people. He wants to come and, and literally, and, and we could talk about this later, but, and I know this wording is going to be confusing, but he wants to perfect you and make you whole and holy and perfect. He wants that for you. But we've also painted a picture of God, unfortunately, that said, God is disgusted by you. And that's not true. Because Jesus came and lived and ate among sinners. He welcomed sinners into his home and he transformed them. He came and he was crucified and he was heaped and hurled insults on him by various groups of people over and over and over again. And he took it on. That's what a holy God does. He takes on our sin. So you don't have to carry it anymore. And he doesn't want you to continue living in it, obviously. But the greatest picture of a holy God that we have is a God who is nailed to the cross in between a sinful humanity, receiving the hurling insults onto him on the cross. And of course, Jesus shouts on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we even sang the words in the song a minute ago, and I leaned over to my wife and said, "Uh Uh-oh, I'm going to directly challenge those lyrics. Because I know I've preached this before too, and it's said that God turned his back in that moment because he couldn't stand to see Jesus with all the sin of humanity on him. But I have another question. What if this was the 
very Jewish, very normal practice of rabbis and disciples. What if Jesus was actually talking to his disciples that night? And he yelled, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jewish rabbis at that time would teach their disciples the Psalms. Just like you would teach your kids. You might say the first couple lines of a song and they would repeat that whole song to you. You might start something for them and then they would repeat the whole thing. It would trigger the memory. And so Psalm 22 starts like this. And I'm going to read it for you in its entirety. And it's long, okay? It's just long. But listen to the words of Psalm 22. Because I want to submit to you that maybe this is what Jesus was doing on the cross. A holy God. Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. You are enthroned as the Holy One. Are you... You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trust you and delivered them. So maybe Jesus is telling his disciples, look to God. Trust God here. In the midst of my suffering on the cross, in the midst of what everyone is saying about me, trust in God. Verse 5, to you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults at me, shaking their heads. Maybe Jesus was simply alerting his disciples to everything that was going on has been written about before in Psalm 22, verse 8. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me to trust in you, even at my mother's breasts. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prayer, pray, open their mouths wide against me. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax, and it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots from my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he is not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to this cry for help. From you comes the themes of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. To the poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down in the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. What if Jesus on the cross is a picture 
of a holy God standing in the middle of the sinful people, redeeming them and reminding the disciples that in your time of greatest despair, in your time when you think all has lost, been lost, remember what God has done. Look back to the Psalms. Dominion belongs to the Lord. He has done it. And with that, the holy God, standing in the middle of the sinful humanity who took on all of our sins, gave his last breath. It was not taken from him. He gave it. And darkness covered the earth. Let us stand together one last time as we sing Man of Sorrows. Man of Sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed. The sin of man in the wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned. Bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor run to thee. Sing, Son of Heaven. Send of heaven God's own Son to purchase and redeem. And reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. My soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor run to thee. Say, now my debt is paid. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the sun sights free, always free indeed. Sing that again. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor run 
to be praise and honor to thee. Good Friday service is traditionally something that we would leave in a reflective and quiet manner over. And so there might be some of you here who just need to do some work with God. Maybe you want to come to kneel and pray at the altar and maybe you want to sit quietly and pray for a minute and reflect on the seven movements.